Hey Wargamers, welcome back to the channel, Death From Above Wargaming. I'm Aaron, coming back at you tonight with a little extra quarantine content. Uh, tonight we have a mech review on the Clint, hopefully to carry you through the week now. I know the Clint is not the most popular mech, however, I do like this guy. Uh, I feel it in my Atrian Knights, I think it's a solid 40 ton mech for what you get. But will Battleytics agree? I don't know. Last week, uh, we rolled out the Shadowhawk. There was some commentary. One of our subscribers, Brian Henry, called the Clint a boondoggle. So I had no other choice but to run it through the Battleytics engine and see where it shook out. But we're going to take a look at the Lost Tech refit as well. So there's the 23T. That's got the AC5 two medium lasers. And then the 23U, which has an ERPPC on it. Both of these mechs very fast, reasonably priced, but which one will come out on top, guys? Stick around and find out. All right, guys, here we are, the Clint 2-3. That's the one we're gonna start with. This is sort of our baseline Clint variant. Uh, there is a 1-2 out there. It does pack an AC-10, um, and it is actually a little cheaper than this one, however, uh, the 696 with the AC5, I think that's the, the money maker. So here it is, 40 ton inner sphere medium mech. Uh, remember, 40 ton, sort of the first, it's the entry level weight class for a medium. It was produced in 2608 uh, and persists all the way into the, I guess the 3100s, the early 3100s. And then uh, master unit list shows this unit going extinct. Uh, now, I don't know, again, if that's just a lack of data um, and a lack of lore around it, but um, this uh, this chassis, no doubt, um, sort of is uh, is prolific throughout those uh, those other periods. Um, one of our one of our users pointed out again. We talked about Brian. He was commenting on uh, in the lore how difficult this thing is uh, to keep running. Apparently, uh, due to some corporate contracts and other things, it was just made with a hodgepodge of of random parts, and so repairing this thing is actually apparently pretty difficult. Uh, so, on to the technical specs. It moves, again, 696. Love the, the 6 on the jump capability. Uh, very useful. It has 10 heat sinks, but based on the weapons, I don't think you're going to need any more here. has an armor mass of 4.5 tons, so that gives it uh, an armor factor of 72 points. So that's not great. 52% coverage for a 40 ton mech. You, uh, you could definitely use a little bit more. Uh, it is down a hand actuator on that right arm. Uh, because that's what's holding that uh, that massive AC5. And when I say massive, I guess for a 40 ton mech, being able to drop five damage at that range is pretty good. Um, Paramedium lasers as well to back it up. So there is some minimum range on that Auto Cannon 5. Uh, I think you can still work the medium lasers and the AC5 in tandem if you're careful. Uh, but uh, it is it is sort of an interesting pairing there. The ammo for that AC5 housed in the right torso. And if you look at that armor diagram in the center, um, it's tough. It's a little bit, little bit under, uh, under loved on those side torsos. So uh, let's take a look at the 23U and see what the Capellans did in their, uh, in their nefarious laboratory here. All right, so here's the 23U, uh, same deal, 40 ton mech, uh, 696. However, battle value is 1081 on this chassis and it was produced in 3050. Uh, so therefore, it has some exciting technology like double heat sinks. You can see the dissipation of this particular variant is doubled over its uh, 3T cousin, so 20 total points of heat dissipation, which will be useful as it does have some very heat intensive weapons. Uh, same armor, right? Same distribution. They did nothing to improve that situation, still at 52.6% coverage. Uh, so this could be a potential downfall of the Clint. Um, or at least something that players need to be watching out for, right, and keeping this mech in, in sort of a, a safer disposition. Uh, according to Master Unit List, this mech uh, was really prevalent all the way through till the end of the lore. Um, so again, talking about the weapons, ERPPC, and both mediums get upgraded to medium pulse uh, varieties there. So that's an important distinction. That does help because you can not only hit easier under normal circumstances, but you can actually start taking on some heat penalties, uh, and those medium pulse lasers can help get you out of a jam where you can still hit reliably, uh, but hold off on that ERPPC and cool down a little bit. So let's run these guys through the offensive benchmarks, and we'll see where they shake out. Okay, so here we are 
we have the Clint 23T and the lighter colors and the 23U and sort of the darker, uh, more translucent uh, colors, if you will. So when we look at the, uh, the heat profiles, first of all, across all the benchmarks, you will notice the 23T builds up no heat. That means, as you guys are probably familiar by now, no chance to optimize, um, no real downside of redlining this thing. It just can't build up heat, so, so that's that. On the baseline side, the Clint T, we'll call it the T and the U, so I saved some breath here. The T uh, managed to rack up 63.8 points of damage. Uh, the U was able to put out 94.7 in the baseline, so that is a substantial, like 50% more damage coming out of the U than the T. So right off the bat, uh, the U looks like a pretty nice improvement from an offensive uh, perspective. Now on the red line side, it can get pretty hot once those medium pulse lasers come into play, but it can really fire that ERPPC all day long and not have uh, too much to worry about. Now keep in mind, this mech can build up six points of heat, both of these variants, six points of heat from jumping. So that's something you do need to keep in mind here. Any heat here is just gonna stack on top of that. So you need to be very thoughtful uh, about firing those jump jets. On the optimized side, uh, what could we do here? Well, again, the 2-3-T, really nothing we could do. The U, though, we were able to squeeze another 10 points, 10.1 to be precise, um, points of damage out of this mech, uh, and that's really by um, bringing more weapons to bear at closer range and taking on some, some substantial amounts of heat, you know, upwards of 15 points, really. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we were able to gain about 10.7% damage on the 2-3-U, um, so not too bad overall, you know, 100 points of, of damage coming out of a 40-ton mech. That's on par with, you know, most 50-tonners that you're going to see, you know, centurions and crabs and things like that. So um, not so bad so far. Uh, let's take a look at lethality and see if there is a notable difference there. Okay, so on to lethality. Uh, a couple of things we want to look at here. First is the kill curve. Uh, no surprise, this 2-3-U delivering substantial uh, kills sooner uh, and, and and in a greater quantity than the 2-3-T. I mean, that 2-3-T really limited uh, by its firepower. Uh, just, you know, again, that AC-5 is the only long-range weapon to soften up mechs before they get within 9 inches. Meanwhile, the 2-3-U does have that ERPPC. Now, granted, the medium pulse lasers don't come into play as soon as the regular medium lasers. Still, you can see uh, just far more effective. So total... Uh, total kills here. Um, the Clint T scored 7.7% in our lethality index. Uh, the 23U scored 54.9%. So major difference. Again, um, this benchmark really critical uh, for context when you put it next to the offensive benchmark. Because again, the overall difference was you know, maybe 40 points or so over a 12 turn game. But you can see what kind of difference that can make. Um, when you're facing down an enemy mech right now granted this is a javelin that it's facing down still um, it's that capability to get those kill shots with those big damage weapons like the ERPPC the reliability of those pulse lasers it really I think sets this one apart so diving into the numbers here um, I think the damage per hit is very telling 8.1 versus 5.0 so 8.1 on the uh, the 23U um, the number of critical hits 2.8 on the 23U versus 1.7 on the 23T. So again, focus very heavily here on the 23U. It's just so much better. It's hitting more, it's hitting harder, it's hitting from further away. And then of course the time to kill uh, is almost half. So that 23U is able to kill that javelin in almost half the time that the 23T is able to do so. Um, so very interesting here, even with all the heat penalties and everything else, the 23U so far, uh, seems to be a superior mech. But again, we're talking about over 300, 311, I believe, my math serves me, 311 point battle value difference. That's a lot. So will it make it up in the efficiency? I don't know. Let's see. But first, let's get into the defensive side. This is where both of them were equal in terms of armor distribution. Uh, the 23U does not have ammo on board. So as expected, the survivability curves are similar, but the 23U is able to eke it out just a little bit. Um, especially in those later turns, 
uh, and you can see the ammo explosions really uh, contributing to that. So the total, um, the total deaths on the side of the 23U was 75%, the 23T at 81.4%. So again, very similar overall defensively. I think really just that ammo uh, making up that little bit of difference. But look, let's look at them holistically. I mean, 75, 80%, that's awful. Um, this mech, for as fast as it is with jump jets, has just terrible survivability. Um, I mean, I would rather have stripped off a medium laser or a medium pulse laser or downgraded the pulse to regular medium lasers and slapped on another couple tons of armor here. Um, you know, it really would, I think, be a wise thing to do if you are using our field refit rules, but you want to kind of keep it close to stock. Um, I mean, just dropping one of those lasers and adding some more armor I think really would make would make a big difference, especially in those torso sections. So woefully be on, be a, a below target here. So you'll see right the yellow lines in our central diagram representing um, where it should be, even with a 52% distribution. So even with a 52% distribution, it's still below target. I don't get it. Most of the armor is on the rear for some reason, um, and frankly, I don't even think I would want to bring this mech in close to anything. So. Uh, just very poor armor design and distribution on this. Uh, definitely a big opportunity for improvement. Let's take a look at the mobility and how that panned out in the sim. The 23T and the 23U, very similar, but there are some notable differences, uh, and I want to call your attention to them. So first of all, you'll notice the 23T has a lower motive hit uh, factor here, so 1.71. That means in your average 12-turn game, it's going to take... Uh, a little over one and a half motive hits, and by motive I mean any foot, lower, upper leg actuator, or a hip. Um, whereas the 23U is basically taking a little over two. Now, if you look at the target mod degradation, though, uh, the 23T is actually lower than the 23U. Um, but regardless, mechs are you know still very mobile early in the game, but as soon as they start taking damage, they melt. And that's a big reason why um, I think we're not going to see these guys being as efficient as they possibly could have been. Uh, again, really weak on the armor side, which leads to slower mobility, which means less damage dealt over time. So speaking of which, let's take a look at efficiency next. What do we have here? Well, the first thing is we've got the survivability curve. We just looked at that. Um, and then at the bottom in purple there, below the survivability curve, same graph, you've got the effective um, the effective damage basically and the effective ACD is your survivability times your optimized damage so what happened well there was massive damage loss in both of these mechs we talked about how bad the defensive side is um, you've got 47.4 percent damage loss on the 2 3 T that means it could be doing twice as much damage if it had better survivability um, and then on the 2-3U side, it's losing 36% of its damage. Again, these are really big numbers. Um, you know, most of the mechs we see really in that 10%, 15% range, 47% is, it's bad. Uh, you're leaving a lot on the table. Now, what that does tell you, though, that does tell you that if you put this mech in a lance where it can survive, where you have more delicious targets to shoot at, um, or your enemy has to shoot at, and this thing can kind of run free and do its job, you're gonna get a lot more mileage out of it. So keep that in mind as we go through this too. Now, where do they shake out on the efficiency scale? Well, the 2-3-T, just abysmal at a 3.11. The 2-3-U, not, actually not bad at a 4.43. Uh, I don't know, I mean, there are thousand point mechs that I think I would probably rather field. Um, you know, especially when you start stacking on, um, you know, piloting and gunnery um, improvements to the Mech Warrior. You know, these mechs, again, that thousand points can become 1400 very quickly. Um, the 2-3, the I think, is a little bit better that way because it is so inexpensive. Um, but regardless, you know, the gunnery sensitivity on both of these mechs are in the, you know, in the 0 0.4 range. Um, so the slope of improvement on, on gunnery and piloting, very similar in terms of what you're going to get out of them mileage-wise. Um, even the best pilot, the best gunner uh, in that 2-3-T is only going to really get a 3.83 for efficiency. So at the end of the day, I was hoping for more out of these mechs, but again, the Achilles heel really is that lack of defense, um, and the speed just doesn't do it. Um, and one lucky hit, you're going to knock a leg off. These things are so woefully under-armored. Um, but they still have a place on the battlefield. Let's take a look at their threat and their roles. Okay, so we'll start with the 2-3-T. 
Um, you know, nothing too terrifying here in terms of threat. You can see that AC5 does do damage all the way out to 18 inches. Um, you know, 24 inches if you're playing with extreme rules as we do. That's, you know, that's not bad. That's equivalent to a PPC. Sure, it does half the damage, but coming out of a 40-ton mech for 700 points, 770 really, uh, it's not, you know, it's nothing to scoff at. So, as you get closer, this mech gets more lethal. It's optimal at 3 inches. Why? Well, the AC is still not quite uh, in, in any, any minimum, minimum range there. Both medium lasers at short range, so everything's really happy there. Um, that's when your zero heat ACD, your maximum ACD that you can deliver, um, is as close as it's going to be to your peak alpha strike, which is 15 points. So 15 points isn't terrible, uh, but it's really not great. I mean, when you're talking about hunting other light mechs, I mean, it could do a good job. You know, it could, it could pace the Stinger, a Wasp, a Locust, you know, those types of mechs. Um, because again, their alpha strikes like nine points or something along those lines. So this thing could be the big dog in those types of fights, but really otherwise not putting out enough damage. Um, again, beneficial, it builds up no heat. So, you know, if you're a new player or, you know, you want a mech where you can just fire everything all the time, uh, this is not a bad mech. When we look at the threat envelope for this mech, now that AC5 conveniently arm mounted, so you can fire with a pretty good arc there. Now, in terms of a roll evaluation, um, I, I just really struggled to pick three rolls for this mech. I think it is a bit limited. Um, so the two that I selected first was a second line mech. So again, survivability is key. It's how you're going to get your return on investment with this mech. So playing it in a role where you have other mechs that are going to be the fire magnets that are going to draw the enemy fire in, use this AC5 wisely until you see an opening and then close in behind a bigger screen or once all the other enemy mechs are tied up, I think this mech would do really well. Um, secondly is a skirmisher. So similarly, you keep it at range, you use that AC5, uh, maybe until the ammo is even at a point where the, the risk of ammo explosion isn't there anymore. Um, and you know you can then close in and try to finish things off with your medium lasers. I think you know even in that skirmisher role, playing a light hunter or something along those lines where you're going after smaller mechs, I think this mech is good in that role too. Um, but that's really um, that's really where where I see this mech playing. Let's take a look at the at the U. Okay, so here we are, two three U. So this um, this one looks a little bit different. There is definitely more uh, more meat on the bones of this threat. Uh, by range analysis. So, first thing is this ERPPC. Uh, love this thing. I mean, this thing can start firing basically as soon as as soon as you as soon as you start playing. Really, um, I mean, if you're playing with extreme range rules, otherwise you got to wait till you get a little bit closer. Um, but still, really king when it comes to range, uh, and it can deal you know 10 points, just solid 10 points in one location, I mean, that's enough to really make heavy mechs run scared. I mean, things like a Marauder or Warhammer, you know, where their side torsos aren't as strong, you know, just dropping 10 points in. I mean, that, that is threatening uh, in and of itself. And it can do that without building up any heat, which is phenomenal. In fact, you know, you can make small jumps, fire the PPC, and really only build up one point of heat, um, if my math serves me right. I think it does. So, um, not bad. Now, when those pulse lasers come into play, that's when uh, that's when things get crazy. Now, this is when the mech can start building up heat. Remember, those pulse lasers are really only uh, effective six inches or within, so very um, very tough, I think, to use these things effectively. Um, but you can start using them right away, even at long range, because for long range for a pulse laser is really medium range for everything else, because you get that minus two um, bonus to shooting with it. When I look at the sort of the peak alpha strike. We're at 22 points. It's a little bit better, right, than the, um, than the T. Uh, the peak ACD uh, is 20. That's at two inches. So basically, this is like you want to get as close as you can with this mech. Um, and then your peak heat, again, you know, this thing's building up four points of heat. Every pull when you alpha strike, if you jump on top of that, you're at 10 points of heat, just like that. Now, again, you can move, you can walk and fire that ERPPC maybe bleed off a couple of points, but really, I mean, firing that ERPPC is using up 75% of your heat capacity on this mech, so just something to think about. When I think about rolls for this mech, um, you know, again, looking at the threat envelope, very similar, except that the PPC goes out further, the medium lasers don't go out as far when you compare to the 3T, right? That the pulses are shorter range, the PPC is longer range. So rolls really are the same. I think this thing 
is a skirmisher by trade. I think you use that ERPPC way more effectively than you could with the AC5. I think you can deal a lot of damage with it and piss a lot of people off, run this thing around, jump it behind hills, jump it into the woods, and just forget about the pulse lasers. If you are playing with rules where you can modify this mech, I mean, I would dump them. I would dump them, maybe put on one medium laser for backup, maybe two if you want to get saucy, put the rest into armor. Uh, you're probably going to see a substantial hike in battle value, um, but I think it would be totally worth it for this mech. Um, but I digress. The other role here is a second line for the same reason as the 2-3-T. Keep it safe. Use it to maximum effectiveness when you see an opening, when you have the upper hand, then you can close with this mech. You are not going to get a return on investment if you charge this mech across the field and get it killed. Conversely, if you're playing against one, blow it out of the water, right? Just take it out. Don't let it run around and get its shots off. Don't let those valuable, you know, uh, those valuable heavy mechs just get plinked to death by Clint ERPPCs. If your opponent isn't smart and he makes a bad tactical move or doesn't move uh, max speed with the Clint and you're looking at a one or two target mod, just nuke the thing because honestly, a couple of PPCs are enough to do this mech in. So anyway, guys, that is my that's my analysis of the Boondoggle, aka the Clint. Uh, again, I still love this mech. I like the 2-3U. Um, I use it in Alpha Strike 2. It's got a lot of good capabilities in that game. Um, I think a lot of the um, sort of the weird things about the, the, the fence and whatnot are, are muted a little bit more than they are in Classic, for better or for worse. Um, again, still very fragile, but uh, you know it's got some punch. It's got a little. It's got some teeth to it, so I like that. You know, again, moral of the story: keep it safe, use it wisely, and I don't think the Clint will let you down. So, guys, interested to hear what you think? As always, thank you for watching. Uh, stay tuned. Don't forget to subscribe. Always more great stuff coming from Death from Above Wargaming, guys. Have a great night.